All right, Guy, good morning. It's great this to feels, have you here. This feels very serious. Uh, <laughs> that this feels, feels like serious. CNN interview. We felt like a CNN crew walking through Richmond to get all the way here. Um, Guy, we know you like coffee. How do you like your coffee done? <laughs> and do you have a, how many coffees do you need in the morning to wake yourself up? Um, uh, so, you know, uh, well, you've, you've started me on a question I didn't know was there, but it's a great question. So, um, you know, you know that too many coffees is not enough. <laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> Well, the other thing that's going to be on my holiday card this year is a quote that I love, which is, you know, everybody's got to believe in something. I believe I'm going to have another coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if I don't have coffee in the morning, it's not like I develop a headache or anything. It's just that um, I feel like something's missing, something like that. Now, what I really enjoy about, and you've now in, had the benefit of some espresso, is that apparently the, those espresso, the espresso extraction method is, leaves quite a bit of the caffeine behind and just takes the taste. So you actually have quite a bit uh, significantly lower caffeine content in the espresso extraction than if you do, for example, French press. Because in French press, you just get everything that was in the bean. Whereas the steam, apparently, the way it goes through the coffee is really good at extracting the taste, but not extracting the caffeine. But I, I would tell you that I think that uh, four or five coffees a day or four or five of those or something with those espresso shots in them is relatively normal for me. But, you know, what I should what I should really tell you is that uh, the, the reason why I like coffee is that I'm self-medicating. And that came so so there's a kind of I think that in in my case, it's there's nothing bad about it, but I have uh, uh, I, I have difficulty controlling my attention. And that is a now I think a well understood sort of way in which some people's brains function. And coffee helps me to focus my attention. That's the thing that it does. So it's a kind of a self medication. It's not actually the most ideal self-medication or medication. So I've actually tried on some prescription. I've tried uh, a little bit of Ritalin. I've tried something called Vyvanse, which actually does it way better without the caffeine. But I prefer to just have the coffee so I don't take that medication. But I think that I started liking coffee because I realized that it gave me it, it gave me that focus, if you like. And if you like um, uh, if you take medication for ADHD, it gives you that focus without the adrenaline. And what coffee does is it raises your heart rate mm. and it has some other um, impacts on your body. But yeah, I could talk endlessly about coffee. But what I would tell you is that I don't know that much about coffee. I know enough about coffee to deliver um, tasty doses of coffee to myself. But there are people who know way more about coffee, way, way more. So. <laughs> uh, talking about self-medication and coffee, actually up to six cups of coffee uh, is shown to correlate with uh, decreased levels of depression. But the exception is as long as you don't put in sugar. So No sugar. Yeah. And I would tell you that, again, I don't know the chemistry of coffee, but, I've, but the little that I know, the chemistry is really, uh, is you'd think it's just, I don't know, you'd think it's relatively simple, but there's some really... I mean, at least to my understanding of it, complex things that are going on. So when the steam goes through the coffee, it's extracting all sorts of oils. And those oils give the coffee texture and flavor. And, you know, the right coffee bean, the right extraction method will optimize that. And then the milk. Uh, when you steam milk well, there's a kind of an emulsification process. Don't ask me, but that cr creation of that microfoam again it gives the milk texture and if i understand it it changes the chemical structure of the milk and there's a sweetness that comes out of the milk i mean this is my wife made this coffee for me i think it was really well steamed milk and um and so you don't need sweetener because this tastes pretty sweet as it is so uh i don't know if coffee prevents me from being depressed i'd be fine with that that's i would it's just worthy. tell you i mean we're, we're um uh, I, I wrote this somewhere on social media. I've been clinically depressed once, 
it is a terrible thing and it's a scary thing and anything that helps somebody avoid dropping into a depression and if coffee is the thing uh, blast away you know one of the things that wanted me to move to switzerland is that bright sunlight in winter time uh, helps prevent and not so much clinical depression but winter blues and the reason why i love the mountains in switzerland is that even in the coldest darkest zurich winters if you get out into the mountains get above the clouds you get the bright sunshine spend a day doing that and it feels great so and even get sunburned in the process exactly which happens often so. <laughs> guy um we know you've had a lot of interviews and so we want to start off on a bit of a different note i figured it would be an interesting idea to start off by discussing books yeah partially it's because we as students have the time and the chance I assume so, to read a lot of books while we're studying. Um, and it's also because I feel there are certain uh, titles or pieces of literature, which you also mentioned in the Education of Value Investor, that paint a good life story. For yeah. you. So I have a list here. Yeah. But I wanted to start off with Jordan Belfort's memoir, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. So, you know, I, and I saw this, I was reviewing your questions this morning. I've not read the book. I have watched the movie just once. Uh, so the name of the firm in Wolf of Wall Street, I should it should come straight to my mind, Stratton Oakmont. I mean, I knew that name when I worked at DH Blair. That was a that was a known firm and they did similar things. And um, I mean, you know, we've well it's in the book. 14th floor was where the brokers were. There were guys who were former drug dealers there. There were definitely prostitutes who went up in the elevator. I was on the second floor. And what's extraordinary for me is that I just didn't say, I'm out of here. And we can dive into why I didn't do that. And before we went on camera, we were talking about why people wouldn't leave a country like Mexico. And so we can talk about that. But um, it, you. Well, I, I wrote about it in the book it, from the movie. It's exaggerated. No, what did I say? It's it's exaggerated, but at its core captures what was going on there. And the world of actually, I would tell you, the world of finance has changed a lot. So I think that at the time, the way those guys felt about the regulators was that, yeah, they're there, but we can keep them at bay. And perhaps all of those people going to prison. So whole bunch of people from D.H. Blair went into prison, actually, even sons-in-law of the owner. That was the beginning of the SAC, and at the time it was called the NASD, the National Association of Securities Dealers, saying, no, we're not going to allow this. We have to reg regulate you, you more strongly. So I think that, that that was in the 2000s. And then obviously after the financial crisis, I think it changed really dramatically in a way that was is as significant not that I lived through it, the changes that happened pre and post the crash of the 1930s. So I realize now that I'm working in a regulated industry and just deal with it. And um, the reg, you know, certainly to stop the kinds of things that were taking place uh, in the Wolf of Wall Street, but also to stop the kind of, I mean, I read an interview with Dick Fold at Lehman Brothers. I mean, kind of the way he ran Lehman Brothers was kind of pretty extraordinary really and look the, the, the our western democracies they eventually get the right idea and they're going to say we're not going to allow you to do that anymore we just we will not we're gonna we don't care if you're less efficient we could we don't care if you make less money we don't care if your shareholders less money make less money we're not going to allow you cowboy like to bet the firm for example in that case on rising house prices and to have a crisis that happens so but it's incredible that early in my career that was possible what's more incredible i could have changed that what's more incredible is that i stuck around for a full 18 months that is what is shocking and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a pessimistic book to start off with to be honest because before you came to dh blair you were at both at oxford university yeah. and harvard business school yeah so tell us about that that experience and what the hell like why did you go from oxford and harvard <laughs> to that and that is you know, how could I have had such bad judgment and how could I have been unwilling to listen to a number of people who said that is not a good idea, Guy? 
and I insisted I remember my I was like 25 years old I, I my 25 year old self wanted to do it to a degree that I remember one university professor just saying I, I realize now remembering his face as I said oh I'm going to go work at D.H. Brer and he says I think that somebody like you should go for something better than that you know trying to put something more between the lines and he doesn't want to quite come out and say that is a very bad idea and I'm kind of insisting so he says who knows maybe the guy wants to be a crook you know? <laughs> which wasn't the case um, so look I think that I, I exhibited very, very bad judgment in choosing to go and work there. I had some reasons which I can, which were not good enough reasons, but you know, just be aware that you can be the smartest guy on the planet. You can have the best education on the planet, but if you exhibit bad judgment, none of that's going to save you, you know? And, and, um, I think maybe if that professor that I've, I don't remember his name, but he would have said, is this good judgment on your part to do this? Maybe, maybe that would have gone in somewhere. But I think that, you know, funnily enough, I have a, so we all rebel at some point from our parents. And I was somebody who hadn't really rebelled from his parents up to that point. I think that was a little bit of rebellion on my part. And in a certain way, we, we ought to rebel in safe ways you know god smiled on me because well first of all i wasn't involved and i was kept far enough away from it that i didn't see it but imagine that i'd allowed greed and i'd allowed some sense of lack of moral judgment to get myself more involved in some of the activities of the brokerage firm on the on the 14th floor and suddenly i ha i have a criminal record because I went too far. I mean, that's, that's kind of scary. <laughs> and I think that, you know, I've been watching a lot of Jordan Peterson videos, a really, really amazing guy. And he says that we all have a monster inside of us. And if we don't recognize that and tame that monster and use that monster when we have to, then we're not really full personalities and we don't really know we're not yet fit for the world. And I think that so in a certain way, if, if you look at the early part of my book and you look at, you know, there's a greed monster in there. You know, better acknowledge that. Better know that it's there. Better know, better know, have a dialogue with that greed monster rather than to walk around pretending that that greed monster doesn't exist. In a certain sense, we should be more comfortable around somebody who says, look, I'm greedy and I recognize I'm greedy or I'm ambitious beyond anything you can imagine. And I recognize that. And here's how I'm here. How, here's how I'm working with that to live a productive life, if you like. So, but the person who pretends they're not greedy or who pretends they're not enormously ambitious uh, and doesn't engage with that part of them. So, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting question. If that professor had said, "Look, I get it. You're ambitious and you're greedy." Are you going about this in the right way? Tell me about your ambition. Tell me about your greed. All right. And now tell me why this is the best way to pursue it. And funnily enough, it that's, you know, Warren Buffett actually maybe Warren Buffett addresses his greed and he says, I'm long term greedy. And that's great because because you just take that and you say, well, long term. Is that the best way to I can tell you, though, that showing up at D.H. Blair and being a vice president and I, quite a few of my classmates, business school classmates, were envious of me. And, uh, um, you know, and I was vice president. How ridiculous. <laughs> Talk about external scorecard. And you talk, yeah, you talk about the external st uh, scorecard in your book. Yeah. And, uh, and also the social pressure of your classmates and, you know, wanting to post in the alumni you know, in the in the alumni meetings and, you know, showing that you've done well. Vice for yourself. President. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I've done a deal, you know. But, you know, talking about you mentioned recovery and you mentioned Warren Buffett. I assume you've read the book in uh, 1996 to 1997, um, Lerenstein's biography of yeah. Warren Buffett. Yeah. Um, How did that change the course of things? So uh, uh, I think that I should reread that book. Uh, I haven't read it recently and I don't even have a copy around. Um, so literally, 
the reason why I picked up Intelligent Bust was not because Warren Buffett had written the introduction, but I thought, I mean, it's a great book title. It's like, well, I think I'm intelligent, so, it's, you know. And I didn't read the introduction, but I read the book, made an enormous amount of sense. I go and read the introduction, uh, discover, you know, I, so, it, it, I've said it before, but you probably heard me say it, but I'm gonna say it again, because it's so powerful. You're not alive if you don't feel envy. You know, you guys are all at the LSE. Of course you're gonna feel envious of either a, a friend who does something that you would have liked to do, you know, or of somebody who's maybe just a few years ahead of you, or maybe of Bill Ackman or of somebody. That is useful information, you know? It's like, listen to that, because that is, the envy is coming from somewhere and, and we can use that, you know, use that for the positive. So by some miracle, I was able to f use the envy that I felt for Warren Buffett. And what was the envy that I felt? I sort of sitting there, I'm under pressure to bring deals in. You know, that was like snake pit. But, um, and, and I have to sell a nasty place, effectively. I have to find these people who want to raise money for their companies, and I have to sell D.H. Blair as a source of funding. You know, I'm like, what a, what a nasty environment. What a nasty job, really, because, because I'm only getting the dregs anyway. And then I have to convince the dregs to deal with the dregs, you know, and it's like, this is my life. And I'm thinking, wow, and there's Warren Buffett. He doesn't have, sell to have, have to sell dregs to the dregs. He's just sitting there and he's, you know, he's talking about this great company and this great business and wh whether he's gonna invest $500 million here or there. I'm envious of that. I wish I was in his shoes. So that envy is, a, is, a, is an amazing emotion. You should be grateful when you feel the emotion of envy. Worth adding, because I still struggle with this and I anger, and uh, I'm going slightly off topic for a second. When you feel anger, also very powerful and powerful. It's a very valuable emotion. Anger says my boundaries have been violated. And then, you know, the, the, the staying from somebody is that ang getting angry is easy, but get angry, getting angry with the right person in the right place in the right way. So to take that anger and say, okay, I'm feeling anger towards this person, this organization, usually it's a person. Now, how do I, so my boundaries have been violated what boundary has been violated? How do I reset this? And I think that there's always a, you either want to cut the person out of your life, you know, there's one reaction, which is an overreaction. The other reaction is, oh, it's nothing. You know, now you're not giving them feedback and getting that middle ground. But so the envy drove me to read um, uh, Lowenstein's biography. And I don't know how often it happens to you. There are some books that you read I read and they're interesting. There's some books that I read where I feel like I ought to read them, so I'm gonna sort of stick with it. And then there are some books that you just like swallow whole. They just, it just goes in. And I kind of, that's what I felt about the Lowenstein biography. It just sort of like, it just, I just soaked it up. And, the, and it was it was kind of, you know, Warren Buffett was living inside my head. And at the same time, I was, I was getting a hold of the annual reports of you know, Cap Cities, ABC, Geico, and I was reading those and understanding, learn, you know, just remember, and I've, I've said this before, but it's still, I, I had business plan after business plan with, with no um, audit statement, with, with not, not real accounts, just hockey stick projections. I mean, such garbage, you know, and then I, then I open up Coca-Cola, you know, and it's like $18 billion of revenues and, I don't know, ten billion dollars of operating income and eight billion dollars of pre-tax earnings. I'm like, oh my gosh! And it's year after year after year. I, I, those numbers aren't exactly right, but that's the way it felt to me. And I just said, I like this. <laughs> How do I do this? And like, you know. So, but yeah, the the Lowenstein book actually, I need to reread it because I think it's probably the best biography of Buffett. Although it probably it doesn't have the later years. So, um, but yeah, fantastic book and fun book to read. But look, so another hero, he should be everybody's hero really is, um, and I haven't read enough about him, but Abraham Lincoln, and it's so funny because Donald Trump says, I'm, I'm the 
best president since Abraham Lincoln. You know, if I was in debate against Donald Trump, the line I would want to use, I'd say, Donald Trump, you are no Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> but Abraham Lincoln was an incredible guy, just an incredible guy. And Abraham Lincoln understood failure. In fact, he felt like a failure for large parts of his life. And um, he understood being bested. You know, in the world of politics, he was bested so many times he either lost or forfeited an election to somebody else. And he just did it. And he developed these deep reserves of um, kind of a, an understanding that the world is a difficult place and the world can deliver nasty and bitter lessons to you. And that's just part of it and just, you know, live with it and work with it. And so what am I trying to say? The, the, the Lowenstein biography is extraordinary, but it's not the only biography, it's not the only hero. And, um, you know, the funny thing is, is that I, I admire Warren Buffett and all of those things. I'm pretty sure that I don't want to be Warren Buffett and I don't want to have my life just like his. So there's, there's a kind of a life cycle that one goes through, I think, when you have a hero where it's okay to get to the other side of it and to say he's an amazing guy. I've learned so much from him. I admire him. But I also know that he's got, I have things that he doesn't have and he has flaws to his personality as well. And that's, so you kind of go through a life cycle. And I think I've been through a little bit of life cycle on that. And probably Warren Buffett would be happy because when I met him at this lunch, so, so there's a story from the Talmud of these, um, of these students who were so enamored with this amazing rabbi and teacher that this is a story in the Talmud, all right? Just the, you know, they would hide under his bed because they just felt like he was such a saint that even the way he interacted with his wife in bed at night was something that they wanted to study. So they would hide under his bed. There's a story in the Talmud. So I'm sitting at lunch and I say, you know, I tell him that story and I say, you know, I'm, I'm a bit like that with you. Do you realize that's like, so you know, like every single thing is like something to learn from. And, and it's so funny. He said, oh, well, I'll check under my bed before I go to sleep tonight, just in case you're hiding there. He's got this amazing sense of humor. Like he just came up with that. And, um, and so he'll be happy to know that, that I've kind of gone through the complete adulation stage. I think that when somebody, if somebody adulates you the way I've adulated Warren Buffett, it's sort of a relief for them to know that you see them as a, as a not, yeah, a full human being, exactly. And, and, and you love them and admire them and adore them with their flaws and that they, and the flaws are okay, actually. So, uh, yeah, but there's the Lowenstein book. And I think that, look, the in a certain way, the book we all know, like I watched the movie of Wolf of Wall Street. I didn't read the book. I wasn't all that interested to read the book. But um, they say when you're studying literature is, yeah, watch the movie, but read the book first and then watch the movie as an aid to understanding the book. And I would say, especially when it's a live person, you know, the book is just one way of building up a 3D picture of the person. And so we shouldn't hanker too much over one particular book build up a 3D picture of who that person is and if they if you admire them and have them uh, in your life. So, but Roger Lowenstein did an amazing job with that book, really amazing job. So I'm glad you've touched on mentors and yeah. the word cloning. Yeah. And I mean, past interviews is something you've mentioned, but could you explain to us more about what you mean by cloning? Yes. And, you know, the people who have influenced you over the years. Yeah. And just lastly, if you were 21, but in our age, yeah. who would you clone? Yeah, and how exactly. How would you go about it? So, so the, the word cloning is, I actually don't think I, it's the word that I prefer to use. It's It comes from, I think it's in Monish's book, but Monish talks about cloning. And, um, you know, cloning is a scientific term for, I think it's you take a DNA and you make a copy of it. And so, uh, but I think that, and I use the word cloning because I've learned the idea from Monish, but it actually goes deep into what makes us human beings. So, and again, um, when I write stuff and I get edited by my friend William Green, 
he always takes all this potted science out and he says, no, we're not putting that in now because this is, a, but, but now he's not editing me so I get to talk about it. Um, you know, mirror neurons are this, so what an amazing uh, thing our brain is because scientists, the way I understand it from my readings of things like Scientific American and New Scientist, there's a model in our head or there are, there are, there's a whole part of our brain that's given over to modeling what is going on with somebody else. So right now, my brain is modeling your feelings. You know, I kind of get a sense of how you feel about me, about being in the room. Um, why do our brains have that is an interesting question. You know, I, so I hope, I hope that you'll allow me, you could edit this out, I guess. So we share a common ancestor with the great apes goes back five or six million years. The Stone Age started three million years ago or so. Um, we got fire. We, we, we mastered the ability to use fire about a million years ago. Bronze Age. So, so Stone Age is like we see that they were using stone tools. Bronze, Bronze Age is, I think, no more than 30,000 years ago, or perhaps as little as 10,000 years ago when we started being able to work with bronze. And Iron Age is like, I think, less than 3,000 years. And computers are like three decades. So you've got a six million years worth of evolution all the way down to more recently where basically we're um, hunter-gatherers. And so I find this fascinating. And it, it I kind of is drawn from uh, Yuval Hariri's book, sapiens and from guns germs and steel by jared diamond where he kind of does they both do this kind of big history thing and says why are we the way we are and so all of that i just did another detour as you can see why uh so mirror neurons we clearly are able to model in our heads what somebody else is thinking and feeling and um i believe that so so part of what's going on is that the way we learn is that we model what is going on with somebody else. And so, um, you know, I would imagine we're going out, you know, hunting and gathering, and the younger person sees how the more experienced person reacts to a certain environment. And the mirror neurons in our head teach us how to do that. We're not gonna be able to do that if we're out there in that environment alone. We're not gonna know how to react to the stone falling, the deer that shows up, whatever it is. So that process of, that is mentorship. And mentorship is not that the person sits down and says, here's how you do it. It's that by feeling what they're feeling, I now learn what I need to feel in this situation. And so I think that when we have a mentor or uh, when we clone people, it goes to the very, very core of our humanity. We're actually activating some very powerful wiring that in a certain way in a modern world we got disconnected from, But, and I'm not gonna be able to cite somebody on it, but somebody famous and well-known and highly respected educator said that what we're actually doing if when we educate somebody is that we're not showing them how to do it. We're actually showing them the feelings around what to do and we're giving them that inspiration and once they have that inspiration. So, so, that, is the, so that is all a very long way of, with quite a bit of potted science in, as you can see, or her here. That is a long way of saying that I think that when we do, when we clone people, when we model them, when we have mentors, we're engaging in some very, very ancient wiring. And I think that as a general rule, when we engage the ancient wiring, we're actually on the right track because, because we just not, you know, we're not gonna overcome six million years of evolution with 30 years worth of computers. So we need to engage that wiring and in many ways, modern technology has divorced us from that. So when we decide to take on a mentor, we're, we're re-engaging that wiring. And the point, that's the point of it, actually, I guess, if you like. And so um, I stumbled across it, but when I sat and I wrote uh, in my office and I said, what would Warren Buffett do in my shoes? Um, 
I was actually engaging that same wiring. I was engaging mirror neurons, and to some degree I can say I'm lucky because I could have him as my mentor even though I had never met him. But I guess my point to here in this room is we, we don't have to have met the person and they don't have to tell us what to do. We can just know enough about them to say, what would they do in my shoes? And we may not get it right, but um, so I think you, there's a second part to the question, which is who, who to yeah, model. Yeah. So, you know, we, um, one place to look is, uh, so, so the, the first thing that I think is utterly critical if it's gonna work is the, um, the person has to activate mo emotions inside you. So I, I don't think I can say often enough for myself to remember this. Emotions are guideposts. They're not just this thing out there that we just uh, like sort of pay attention to when we uh, have to deal with the women in our lives or something like that, you know, or the let's just say the um, because we don't want to we don't want to significant excite. other. Significant <laughs> other. Yeah, that kind of takes <laughs> takes all sorts of <laughs> into account. Exactly. They are, they are signposts to action. So I would say, the but this, by the way, goes, does, does this person activate um, my emotions? Because, because Warren Buffett, for some reason, activated my emotions. But for somebody else, it would have been a different individual. So you know, who knows exactly what it is that activates that, but we have to trust that sense. And then I guess, you know, what, what's really important is what values does this person represent? Are they living a life that um, I would like to live? Because I think that I, I could imagine, I mean, actually, funnily enough, if we take the guy that I worked for at D.H. Blair, the head of the Jordan Belfort Wolf of Wall Street firm that I worked at, I had a certain amount of envy for him. I kind of, he was a successful guy. He was reputed to be worth at the time half a billion dollars, which seemed to me to be like an enormous amount of money. And he ran a business and he was successful and he had a big family. And uh, so I had, so, so my emotions were activated there and he was available to me. He was willing to have me in his office, but he was not the right guy to have as a mentor because he played fast and loose with the law, if you like. And actually, look, he's really, really smart guy. He had other people break the law for him. So, you know, when, when he got investigated by the NASD, or it was the sister firm, not the one that he was closely related to. So, uh, so that, I think that was in a certain way, my downfall there. So you wanna, you wanna get maybe some, if you're not sure, get some guidance from other people and people that you trust, look, is this a guy should I, should I, I mean, so I think today, today somebody that I would want to um, uh, clone is Reed Hastings. There is so much about Reed Hastings that I'm just so impressed with in a thousand different ways. And I think that, I mean, his books here actually, I'd want to understand how he's achieved, what he's achieved. And now, Reed Hastings is, I think, a highly, highly ethical guy. But if I wasn't sure, so let's take somebody else. So he's a guy to clone. Um, I think that Jeff Bezos is just like, you know, it's like he's beyond anything. <laughs> but obviously he's a, he's a guy to clone or to try and understand how he is become who he is. And, and actually, as I saw the question this morning, I think that, I mean, I, again, it, it, I don't know how the hell you clone the guy because he seems to be such a geni genius as Elon Musk. I mean, who... Who would not want to try and clone that guy? But but there's another book that is on my reading list that I've delved into a little bit. I think it's over there, uh, Schwartzman's book. Mm -hmm. I think he's. A, I think that when you get into more finance types, I think that you know there's the danger of cloning somebody who has actually used shortcuts and they've been successful at hiding their shortcuts. So I think that I read a book about Carl Icahn when I was younger and I was really, really impressed with him. I don't think that I want to clone Carl Icahn. I think there are things, I mean, you just need to watch that YouTube video of his interaction with Bill Ackman. I don't know the facts of what happened there. It's something to do with, um, oh, they, there's some uh, transaction that took place and 
there was something insurance it was called. But I don't want to get into relationships like he seemed to have with Bill Ackman at the time. We can sort of leave it as at that. But you want to be more careful. Or And something else that one wants to be careful of is that when you haven't met the person, they will cultivate a persona that doesn't show the whole truth. I think the guy at D.H. Blair cultivated a persona that didn't show the whole truth. It was much easier to do that because you didn't have the internet. You didn't have a thousand different articles about you. I mean, when I wanted to do my due diligence on the guy at D.H. Blair, I had to go to the Harvard Business School Library and I have to, had to pull out microfilms of the New York Times to see what articles were written about him. And I saw a couple of articles. That was it. That was kind of like what I could do. It's not like going into the internet or going into some online database and typing in a search term and uh, seeing what comes up. But the final, so, so, but even today, people work hard to cultivate a persona, persona that doesn't capture all of who they are and doesn't necessarily capture all of why they became successful. And uh, so you want to be careful in choosing that person, but you start with, and I, you know, I don't know if I can do it on the interview, but, um, we can do it now we can do it later who who do you who does generate that sense of envy it's like you know who does it for me who's not in finance is steven spielberg mm. so you know you talked about movies i have zero artistic ability so i i believe i i appreciate art in all sorts of forms but i have zero in terms of creativity but i ask myself I kind of, if you could walk, step into anybody's shoes and be living their life, wouldn't it be, I mean, I think that Steven Spielberg has had such an amazing life with so many amazing people and he's created these worlds in these different movies, whether it's, you know, Close Encounters of the Third Kind or, you know, movies about the Holocaust or movies that have, uh, you know, Saving Private Ryan. I mean, so many, and that seems to me like, to be like an extraordinary life, but I think that they're high quality guy just not something that I'm capable of. So I don't think I could learn that much from him. Yeah. And uh, the, you know, the issue with mentors sometimes is, as you briefly mentioned, is there needs to be a lot of material on them for you to, to take in, to be able to learn from them, which is often hard. You, you know, you don't have the, you don't have a huge choice sometimes yeah. in certain industries. Um, and you also talked about being you know, finding a mentor who's been honest about their failures and shortcomings. And, and certainly a huge, what, what's, what surprised me in the book is how honest you are throughout the yeah. entire, through the entire book. You know, you talk about blow ups that you had at home during stressful times. You, yeah. you talk about, um, you know, your shortcomings, your personal shortcomings, your career shortcomings. Um, you, you're very, you're very honest about this. So can so, I just step in there for yeah. a second? I hope it doesn't break your train of thought. No. But um, so that was part of the motivation to write the book. So you know they, they they say that pearls are created when there's something there's something in there a piece of sand that irritates the oyster and and I was looking for mentors and it irritated me that people were not being honest and eventually I'd be like yeah that's not the full story is it I know you're hiding certain things about yourself. See, the last time that happened, in my opinion, is the book about Jack Ma. And, you know, I probably get the Chinese Secret Service onto me or something, but I'm sorry, Jack. That is, that is not even half the story. And, you know, you don't even give a clue. And just the story of how Ant Financial got out of the hands of Yahoo. And, and I, sorry, Jack, that is not honesty. But, but what inspired me was that so I've met, met um, Monish Pabrai, and for some reason he talks to me about Mahatma Gandhi. And so then I come out of that and I buy Mahatma Gandhi's book and it's sitting on a bookshelf somewhere. Then someday I read it. And, uh, you know, so, so I pick up Mahatma Gandhi's book and I, I feel like within the thir first 30 pages he starts talking about his, um, his dalliances with prostitutes. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the autobiography of Mahatma Gandhi. And he's talking about his dalliances with prostitutes. <laughs> it's like, holy moly. <laughs> and then he talks about eating meat. And, you know, it's like eating meat is like the hugest sin for his family. But that was a, an inspiration for me 
So I said, if he can be that honest, and I have to say that reading the book about Nelson, Ma Nelson Mandela, My Long Road to Freedom, and uh, I hope that members of his family won't be upset with my saying this, he did not achieve the same level of honesty with the reader as uh, Mahatma Gandhi did. And so this comes through one way or another, you kind of uh, figure it out. So um, I wanted to do that. And what happened to, you know, it, it's a certain act of courage to do that. But I was inspired by somebody who wasn't alive. Let's just remember that. And when you say you're looking for mentors, it's true. You're not going to find somebody like Reed Hastings who kind of talks about how he built this extraordinary media business. But, you know, Abraham Lincoln, I talked about Abraham. So we can delve into the past and, you know, Charlie Munger's famous statement, we can hang out with the eminent dead, if you like. But yeah, the book is honest and there's a reason for it to be honest. I want it to be honest, both because that was the purpose of writing the book and also it was great psychotherapy for me. I know where I was when I wrote the chapter on D.H. Blair. I know exactly where I was and where I was when I finally said to myself, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to put this in the book. You know, it's like come hello high water, no matter what happens. And I just wanted, sorry, <laughs> you had a question. Can I keep going? Oh, good. Go ahead. Monish Pabrai has a, so you, he, he says it in such a harsh way and it's kind of shocking, but I think it's still probably true is that you can be a mass murderer and the world will forgive you if you're honest about it and you ask honest forgiveness for what you've done. People in a certain way don't care how bad you've been they care about whether you whether, whether you're honest about it and when it, whether you're confronting how bad you've been honestly which by the way is the appeal of Donald Trump he makes he he just says it straight yeah that was locker room talk yeah i've 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 had a lot of fun with women in my life i you know that's who i am and you know i've never wanted to cause any woman any harm and people are like you know i don't like him but he's being honest about it and uh, the world is reacting so badly. I think the people who, who do virtue signaling don't realize how badly the world is reacting to it because people don't say it. They say, I don't like it. I'll, I'll kick you out at the voting booth. And that's why the next week is going to be so freaking interesting. But um, uh, sorry, I want to I keep going on this because it's just so important. And it's so amazing, I mean, uh, because Jordan Peterson explains it better than it's been explained to me to date, is the world is a very, very complicated place, and there's absolutely no way that one human being can either understand it or predict it. But when you're, br where you're honest, and you say it how it really is, you're setting yourself on the side of how things will unfold. Whereas if you try and modify the truth, if you try and hide something, if you try and present it in a different way to what it really is, you're setting yourself against reality. And so it's more likely that reality is gonna win because it's just infinitely more powerful than we are as human beings. So being honest and truthful, first of all with ourselves and second of all with the world is extremely extremely important for a successful life and um and so in a certain way the book was an exercise in that if you like so sorry i interrupted you or stopped no, you from no, no. continuing uh um i mean and you you do you do have moments in the book where you you actually stop and you go i i'm not sure whether i should write this or not you have mo <laughs> you have several moments like that in the book so and I don't mean to toot your horn too much, yeah. but if if there is, you, you know, you talk, you've talked about, you know, a lot of the world knows you for having cloned or having tried to, you know, learn from Warren Buffett. Yeah. Uh, you've adapted that to your own personality, uh, as we spoke about earlier. But if there's one thing that we would want to clone from you as students uh, or aspiring investors, uh, what would that be? I feel like I want to throw the question back at you and say, yeah, yeah. what would that be? <laughs> oh. uh, but there's, th there's so many things and there's so many things we're going to get into um, in this interview, which we want to discuss. You know, one thing is definitely is definitely 
the compounding of goodwill, yeah. that whole concept. Um, uh, and but but also, for example, you just mentioned the uh, seeing reality as a greater force than than any individual. For example, I've never thought of it that way. Um, so I, 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 it's not fair of me to throw the question back at you, although I don't mind doing unfair things. And <laughs> you, that's OK. But um, uh, so I, I think that when when we clone um, again, I can't tell you what to clone because that would be kind of telling you what should engage your emotions. And I can't tell what's going to engage your emotions. In fact, you don't know what's going to engage your emotions. So that's something that you have to each individual has to figure out for themselves. Uh, and we can definitely take cues from other people. But if I if I if I say what what lessons do I think that I can impart to um, students, I think that I mean. Uh, so so towards the end of the book, I think I, I write something uh, along the lines of get the right people in your life because they will teach you everything that you need to know. And once you've gotten those people in your life, so don't worry about modeling a spreadsheet industry something get the right person who will be able to bring you to wherever it is that you need to go um and so how do you do that and actually i i think that if i so that getting around the right people is 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 perhaps the most important thing and actually if i if, if i stop and think about it and i don't think it's in the book but so yeah since the book and i don't I, so i i did a I, I went on a 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat. Uh, I lasted three days. <laughs> <laughs> what happened I'm the ashamed. other seven days? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I can talk about, so I, I lasted three days. I aspire to do a 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat again sometime in the future. And we can dive into why I only lasted three days. But those three days were extraordinarily powerful. And I came out of that, I don't want to say changed person, but I explored areas, mental areas that I don't think I would have been able to get to if I had not gone and done that. And I, I just to give a, sort of a very short indication, I mean, we all have, now you can get all these meditation apps on the phone. After having done that retreat, any guided meditation with some idiotic voice telling me what to do, open my eyes, close my eyes, you know, no. And by the way, any stupid music, no. The only thing that, that, that I want are the timed bells or something that, that gives me a sense of passing of time every five minutes or every 10 minutes. But um, getting the right people in your life, but also the ability to sit alone and just accept what is going on and to think about it rather than to do would be, I think, some of the most profound lessons that I'd want to impart. But um, the, the getting the right people in your life and how you go about doing that, there are some really, really practical skills to go about doing that. That uh, So if, if, the, if the big idea is get the right people in your life and you know one of the ways to do that at scale is to grow goodwill, but then there are some very, very practical skills. And I'll give you one again from my poor family. They're hearing Jordan Peterson's name every five minutes. But, but here's something incredible. So we all have friends who studied engineering. You know, do you know? And, and it, so, so engineers are more interested in things than in people. So engineers have, some engineers have a hard time socializing and they get a very high sense of anxiety when they go into a room where there are a lot of people. So the simple fix or a possible fix that Jordan Peterson gives to those people is, you know, when you go into a social situation and you're feeling nervous, what do you do? You look at your shoes. That makes you more nervous. Your hands start sweating. You don't know what to do. You keep looking at your shoes. And what Jordan Peterson says is, just look into people's eyes the way that both of you are right now with me because so you didn't notice what you just did but i said that and you blinked and you had a little bit of it and you just nodded yeah. because the minute you're looking into somebody's eyes there's a whole bunch of um uh, systems in the brain that engage and mirror neurons and god knows what and then you can come out of yourself and you be can become so that's an amazing fix 
And that is kind of a clickware type. You, you take a kind of a, um, what may feel to the engineering type, an uncomfortable step, an unnatural step, lift your eyes up from your shoes and focus on somebody's eyes in the room and you'll see that you'll start feeling safe and comfortable. I find those kinds of, so when I talk about writing thank you notes, that is effectively what I'm addressing. I'm addressing what are the kind of the basic fixes that we can do with our interactions with the world to start the process of growing goodwill, to start the process of getting the right people into our lives. And you're not going to be able to get the right person into your life if your only choice is a group of people at a cocktail party, if you can't talk to anyone. So your first step with the engineer is who who's socially awkward is not well, you've got to go and find somebody who's got the right moral qualities and the right... No, you just got to find somebody. So you need to teach that person how to look somebody in the eyes. And so growing goodwill is a big idea, but there are so many little pieces that can be a part of that. And, and kind of they're, 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 um, uh, they're building blocks. And what's important as we have a conversation like this here is that we don't you know we don't know where somebody is on this i think i strongly believe that there are some basic building blocks for success that i still don't have and um uh so i am so i hate calling up people who might invest with me our mutual friend Chantal knows all about that and I think you know there's a certain element of the engineer standing at his staring at his shoes that is going on with me and so I can talk in grandiose terms about growing goodwill but that is a building block that I still need to acquire in my life fully and own it and internalize it and um, but interestingly enough if I get the right team around me and I have an amazing team around me right now and if I'm honest with them about my failings, they're like, I think I have a real problem here. You guys need to help me with it. Please, if you catch me staring at my toes or avoiding talking to people that I need to be talking to me, catch me and make me do it, is kind of the way I kind of learn and overcome that. And that's perhaps a part of getting the right people in, in your life. But so what am I, what is the lesson? Get the right people in your life for sure. But don't walk around saying that figure out what the building blocks are for you and everybody's different one person will be like oh yeah i walk into a cocktail party and like i'm talking to everyone now it's my my issue is selecting the right person another person is just getting to talk to people the thank you notes is just a, a little building block and interesting enough just for your interest so there's a part of me that's shy that needs to conquer that the thank you notes was a, a stepping stone or is a stepping stone because I might not be able to call the person up and say, but I'm OK to write a thank you note. <laughs> so great. So we've spoken about you know, values of life, philosophies yeah. and so many other things. How have all these things influenced your investment approach? Yeah. And I guess that you've already heard from me. Um, uh, I've made enormous mistakes. I don't think I can tell you about. Uh, I don't think I'm qualified to say what is what is the right investment approach. I've talked about um, make sure that whatever you do, get the power of compounding going for you. And now I remember what I was going to say, which is that realize that when you're a student and you're studying what people are saying why are they saying it and realize that they themselves may not fully understand why they're saying what they're saying. So I'm just going to give, give you a few of the sort of the ways in which people communicate and you have to look at the meta communication. So there's a guy, I haven't met him. I'm unlikely to meet him. He publishes something, the boom, doom and gloom report. Uh, the nature of this communication is that it says, I'm going to scare the living daylights out of you about some event that might happen. And that scaredness is going to grab you. It's going to 
grab you by the routines and circuits in our brains that are designed to pay attention to something that is going to be scary. So that's going to get me, that's going to get your eyeballs or get your attention on me. Then I'm going to, I'm going to um, pivot from scaring the hell out of you to telling you what you need to do in order to protect yourself. That is a common theme in investment newsletters primarily, but also some investors raise money that way. And it's a routine, if you like. And I think that I save myself an awful, awful lot of brain cells and an awful lot of grief when I was able to set, identify that early. Because once you've identified that that's what you what is going on, I can switch it off. And, and there, you know, I never mentioned the boom, doom and gloom report. And at least in that, the guy who writes it, who's based in Hong Kong, is in a certain way being honest with the reader. He's saying, this is the boom, doom and gloom report. And so like, come here for boom, doom and gloom. You know, that's what you're getting. And inevitably what he says is buy gold. You know, so he's what is called a gold bug. Like the world is going to hell in a hard basket. Everything's going to fall apart. And the only thing that's going to work is gold, buy gold. So the minute you know that, but the minute I know that I can, but there are some investors who do that as well. Uh, and so that's a whole class of communication that one can say, do I want to expose myself to? Uh, here's another, I'll just give you a couple more. Um, <clears throat> there's the <clears throat> macro analysis. You know, I'm going to write, so that the way the macro analysis goes is, I'm going to write so eloquently because I've been trained to do it about the macro economy that you're going to get the feeling that I actually know what's going to happen next. And you're going to read like these paragraphs of make you feel like I've got incredible insight. And therefore, because I've got incredible insight, you're going to invest with me or you're going to follow my recommendations. And, uh, you know, so so that is a an art form. It's 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 incredible to see when people do it well. But the brutal, harsh reality is nobody knows what's going to happen next. You know, as Howard Marks said, nobody knows. But, but that kind of writing draws people in. And in investment banks, the people who are super good at writing that way, they're called investment strategists. You know, they're called macro analysts. And so there's a game going on. The game is they pretend to the people who want to hear that kind of stuff that they know what's going to happen next. The rea reality is that they're salespeople for the firm because the, the unwritten understanding is I'm going to make you feel like I know what's going to happen next and therefore you're going to come and do your trades with us or you're going to come and invest your money with us or you're going to come and engage with us. So, there's, so we've got boom, doom and gloom. Uh, you know, chicken little, sky's falling on our head. You need to listen to me, I will save you. Then there's... Um, uh, there's the macro analysis guy. And then you could go into, uh, you know, the, the person who knows an enormous amount about, about a specific space. So it's like biotechnology is going to take over the world. This is where the future is. I know so much about it, you know, or um, cloud computing. I know so much about it or whatever it is. So there, you know, it may be that somebody really does have an industry uh, an, an, an industry specialty and they actually do know a lot about the industry and they're a good analyst but in general somebody who knows a lot about an industry or a particular area does not necessarily make a good investor so um so all of that you, you know you you graduating from lse you're going into the world you're going to be swimming in that soup you know and 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 i think that you need to know or you need to start developing a sense of uh, what is it that is in front of me? What is unwritten? What is not said about this piece of communication? There's actually the, imp and you know, in the world that we are in with YouTube and Instagram, what have you, we lack context. And actually the context is everything. And we can see how badly we can be manipulated in politics when they take clips that are out of context, but that's going on in the investment world as well. So we, we need to see that and understand that, you know, the newsletter doesn't land in your inbox saying, hey, just that, so you know, my business model is that I send this out to three million people out of the three million people. Half a million get get so scared that they're dialing the phones all day long. And I got people on the other side of the phone that take the people who 
are scared enough and have enough money and I open up accounts on them. That is not said. You just see the email in your inbox. So, um, and you know, the people who are really just working to compound money, they have figured that out. So I'll, I'll give, uh, you know, I just need to stop and make sure that they won't be upset that I say these names, but we've all heard of Li Lu. Li Lu runs money for um, Charlie Munger. He's not out talking to anyone, you know? He's not, he's not giving interviews the way I am. Uh, so there's one. I'll give another name, Josh Tarasov. Uh, you should try and interview Josh Tarasov, but he probably is gonna say no, because he's just said, no, that interferes with my thinking. I don't wanna do it. Uh, there's another guy called Arvind Navratnam. He teaches a class at, I believe, Boston College and Harvard Business School that, again, is not out there talking. He's not out there saying stuff to the world. And so that's important to realize. So, so if you plan on compounding, the difficulty is, is that the people who are quietly compounding, we can't learn from them. That was your, yeah, I just want to find them. OK, so that's fine. So we have to learn from the people who are communicative. But what bias do they have and what bias or what is what is contextual to the communication I'm receiving that I need to take in in order to get the full picture? And I would tell you that so so um, I wrote a book. Was the book a net positive for my investment performance? It's not clear to me. I can't unequivocally say yes and I can't unequivocally say no. Why did I write the book? I wrote the book uh, for a number of reasons, but at least a part of it was to feed the part of me that's narcissistic. So, so there's, there's all sorts of biases to communication which relate to, I want to build my business. And if I tell you the full story about what I'm doing, you're not going to send me your money. So I'm not going to tell you the full story. And I've, I've given you some of those examples. And then there's just personal biases. So um, uh, I, I write a book and in some level, it kind of feeds narcissism inside me. It's like, it feels good. I, I want to kind of be known in the world. And there are other reasons to write it as well. Good reasons, like I want to be honest. I want to share with people something that I think is important to share. So it's not the only reason. Um, but I guess you, you, when, you, when you're evaluating Guy Spear, why is Guy Spear doing this interview? you want to know is there is there a drift is there a, is there a bias there is there something that's not said that uh, ought to be said and, I, and and actually I would say in my case when I talk about people like Li Lu or um, Arvind or Josh I think they're actually living in a certain way a better life <laughs> because there is a limit to what being in the public eye can give you uh, and what actually will happen, and what happened to me for a period of years after writing the book, is that it's amazing how the ancient myth, so the, we all know the image of Narcissus. I like the best the Salvador Dali um, painting. Narcissus, the story of Narcissus is that, I don't actually know the full story, but he fell in love with his own image, and he fell so in love with it that he fell into the water and drowned. You know, and that's a nice little myth but it is not um it is extremely relevant to the story of me after my book was published because i had some very difficult years in the fund because i'd done a little bit of that and what is important for you to know is that why did that happen i didn't i was aware that of sort of like keeping one's ego under control and of the dangers of narcissism uh, but I wanted the book to succeed, and that is an understandable, and um, it's totally fine to want a book to succeed. It's totally fine to want to promote the, your book. Of course you want to promote your book. But at what point does promoting your book become an exercise in narcissism, if you like? So there are all sorts of, when you see communication from people, and you want to learn, but you will not get the best lessons and the best insights if you don't see all of the uh, context in which it's happening, both business reasons why they might keep stuff, 
they might not say something and also personal biases like is this guy communicating out of narcissism is it and i would tell you look howard marx is an amazing guy um you know you don't need me to say that warren buffett has said that uh my friend william green who's publishing a book uh, has said that but also he does not take investment decisions on a daily basis. The oak tree has now been acquired by Brookfield Asset Management. Uh, they're in a certain way in the fundraising business. Howard Marks is an amazing um, brand communicator. And so we have to realize that when Howard Marks writes a memo, he's also doing that, you know? And and it's it's a harsh thing to say. And, and I, in a certain way, feel like I'm yeah. Who, who am I to question what Karl Marx, uh, Karl Marx, Howard <laughs> Marx, how, where the hell did that come from, to question what Howard Marx is doing. But I think that I'm better off knowing that that is, and Charlie Munger has this thing, you know, never ask a barber if you need a haircut. That's Ooh, right. That's so, you know, no, and, and what Charlie Munger says is apply a windage factor. So, yeah, you can ask the barber if you need a haircut and the barber will tend to want to see that you need a haircut more often than you don't. And so it's not, you know, with Howard Marks, realize which way the wind is blowing. With Guy Spear, which, you know, is that, why is he doing this? What part, how do, so we have to be really smart about how we learn from the world. We should never ever be in a situation where we're just studiously taking notes from anybody, even the most and it started actually when I realized it, I was sitting with the guy who was the former, I think he was like the former CEO of one of the Berkshire insurance companies. And he's sitting next to me at a dinner in New York and he said this one thing and it was so powerful and valuable. He, it, well, it, I didn't realize at the time, but I realize now he said, you know, the thing about Warren Buffett, he said to me is don't just pay attention to what he says, pay attention to what he does. And so, and, and I can't remember what it was in the context of, but, but that, that so, so listen to what I say, listen to what Howard Marks, Bill Ackman, George Soros, you name it, but then pay attention to what I actually do and see if that aligns and build a 3D picture of the person. So I don't know if that's investment advice. I don't know what that is, but. I have a follow up question to that. It feels like there's a lot of questioning in what you've just said, so questioning people's where's the what are the bias, what where are the motivations? Yeah, would you say that's central to investing for you? You know, the the Richard Nolan was a professor of accounting at Oxford, Oxford at Harvard Business School. He did many things that were just so valuable. It's just incredible. Professor of accounting, not the most interesting subject. One thing he did was he he did this in class, and I've done it a couple of times, and I've given talks. Is he said. He took everything in front of the audit report, all the kind of colorful photographs and stuff, and he ripped it out and he said he tossed that in the bin. Don't think that's entirely right because um, you should read the letter, but you know, the accounts are really, really important. But um, he said something else. He said, when you look at any set of accounts, who prepared them? You know, the accounts are not neutral. Who prepared the accounts? What are they trying to communicate to what audience? What slant are they trying to give it? There is a slant, try and identify the slant. And the accounts of publicly traded companies are not neutral. You have, um, you know, I'll tell you. <laughs> so um, I am a client of Salesforce and it's very painful to me for me to see that the company's done way more than a 10x and I was aware of this cloud business model 10 years ago and I didn't invest but I went through the 30 not the uh, is it 13 F filing the uh, proxy statement uh, not so long ago and you can see very clearly that there is a fight going on between um, Mark Benioff and his board. So Mark Benioff on the one hand is a billionaire, but he's getting paid a salary of tens of millions of dollars a year. And the board are saying, or at least some members of the board and certainly some in institutional investors are saying, this is egregious. You know, and you can see how the way the numbers are presented is, is, is a result of that kind of to and fro. So I guess I'm just making the same point now with, with respect to company accounts, but 
look, it goes, yeah, I mean, it goes to, if you're going to read, and I haven't, I brought his name up. If you're going to try and read and understand Karl Marx, understand his biases, understand him in the context of the world in which he lived, in terms of his relationships, what, what was it, and what bits are missing from the communication. Uh, but in terms of just going back to your original question, investment approach, um, uh, I've taken far too long and I've, I've, well, this is an, another interesting thing. So why did I not buy Apple when I understood it? Why did I not buy Amazon when I think I understood it as well as anybody else did? And I was slavishly saying, yes, but my hero Warren Buffett's not buying it, so I can't buy it, you know? not happening because I'm a I'm a dyed in the wool value investor. So if you slavishly follow heroes too much, then um, you can you can miss out on stuff. And it's an interesting balance because I've I've said in the past that if you if you clone investment ideas, it's like bowling with with the curtains up, you know, you're you're inevitably gonna get the ball in more or less the right place. And if you're so if you're worried about compounding, which you should be then that's a good thing at the same time at what point do you at what point do i say i know enough to be able to say yeah warren buffett's not doing this but i'm okay to do this if you think too originally too soon you may do some serious damage to your ability to compound but if you don't at some point allow yourself to think originally you're going to leave opportunities on the table in life and you know henry ford had he had this statement he said somebody should be learning at least till age 40. So you just start trying to be creatively original until you're at least age 40. And I think that that was said, you know, 50 years ago or more and life expectancy has increased. So we could take, you know, 50 is the new 40. So don't, you know, but they're, they're, they're great questions. And, um, and I would also say, look, I don't think there's there's there are things that bill ackman has or here in london chris Hahn has that it, and it's an emotional orientation to the markets that i don't have i just don't have it so that's kind of you know so you're asking me for in for insights where i really do feel like i'm an imposter i think the news that i can give you is that you cannot have it and still do just fine because you know yeah and, and on that last last line you've in a recent interview, likened um, investments uh, or investing approach to a drunk in a bar. Um, <laughs> as a student, that's very that's that's great. Is that good or bad? Yeah, that's great. I mean, if it's uh, if the investment approach is a drunk in a bar, then uh, wow, a lot of students are going to be happy. So, can you explain that more? Yeah. And w I guess to start off with, why do so many uh, investors think that they're a fighter pilot? And what does that mean? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, realize that. So I, I started with the book saying I'm going to be brutally honest with the world about who I really am. And I'm in this lucky place that, and I really did have to face up to the possibility that um, I'd be brutally honest with the world about who I really am. And they'd be like, well, that's great, but I'm pulling my money from you right now. Thank you so much. Uh, so I can afford, but, but now I'm on the other side of that and people say, yeah, okay, but I know who he is and I'm happy to be invested with him. So I feel safe to continue to be brutally honest. But realize, and again, if we go back to the different styles of communication, even if they're not scaring the living daylight side of you or being you know, macro geniuses or some other kind of genius, there's a huge amount of investment communication which says, I know what I'm doing so you can trust me. So it's kind of a scary thing for a guy who's trying to build a business or a woman who's trying to build a business or a non-binary for that matter who's trying to build a business uh, and say, um, uh, I don't the hell know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I'm lucky that I, I can do that. But we're at our strongest when we recognize our weaknesses, because then we can turn our weaknesses into strengths. And so I think that that's the key to being in any way successful. And I happen to think that I have a very significant number of weaknesses. And it may may genuinely be the case well, relative to some of the most incredible investors on the planet, I have more than, when compared in that peer group, I have way more weaknesses than they do. I can't get rid of them, they're part of my makeup, 
but I can be honest about them. So the guy who's a fighter pilot is pretending, and some of them at least are pretending to their investors that they're something that they're not. Yeah, I'll tell you a story that, two stories. One guy is a guy, I won't remember his name. It was one of the most public and phenomenal flame outs ever. So he ended up in one stock leveraged and the stock symbol was MCH. And he was leveraged in that stock and it was a gas, natural gas company. And gas was trading at like $4 per barrel per MCF, which is the kind of unit of volume that you trade. And he was convinced it was going way, way higher. And this company was highly leveraged to the price of natural gas. And instead the price of natural gas collapsed. And that was the end of his fund. <laughs> oh. And uh, he stopped redemptions. So he had the clause in his investment contract that allowed him to stop redemptions. And the last I heard, he's managing a bar in um, somewhere, somewhere in the United States and, oh. and has the rump of the fund still going. So but there was a reason why I was telling you that. And again, I've, I've lost my train of thought. So remind me where, what the question was. Fighter pilot. You were just going into. Explain. Right. So he communicated like that. He was like, this is, this is, you, you're going to see, you know, I'm aiming on the target. And he had this belief about himself that that's who he was. And it turns out it wasn't the case. Now, in contrast to that, you have Mike Burry and we've all seen the big short. So, you know, if you're an outside investor, I don't remember the MCF guy, but you've got the MCF guy and you've got Mike Burry, you know? And Mike Burry is this incredibly brilliant guy who turns out to have been right. And he made an enormous amount of money. But then on the other side, you've got the other guy. So is it the MCF guy or is it Mike Burry? <laughs> and I think that, you know, Mike Burry, if you would, if you look at the movie and you look at that story, and I guess for people who are listening, Mike Burry is a guy, an investor, fantastic analyst in the period prior to 2008, realizes that there's this enormous bubble in the housing market and that it's going to go south. And he bets an enormous amount in a leveraged way using credit default swaps against the housing market. And um, investors get super scared. They get super upset. Some of the investors pull their money out before it happens, but then we get the crash of 2008-9, Mike, Mike Burry makes insane amounts of money for his investors and he retires. And so Mike Burry says, yeah, I know there are people who think of themselves as fighter pilots and are not. I'm not one of them, trust me. But when you're on the outside, you have to say, well, do I trust this or not? And it's not shoes that I would like to be in. And what I believe is that the person who thinks they know may know or they may not know so mike burry the history of that is that he he said i am that guy who knows and this will work out spectacularly the guy who did mcf also thought he was that guy and so how do you know so mike burry would say yeah but i knew i wasn't that guy but the guy who blew up also thought he wasn't that guy so so you know now i want to try and pretend to myself in some situation i'm the fighter pilot you know, and, and then, you know, how do I know that I'm actually Mike Burry or maybe I'm and I think that there's a far better thing to do, which is just assume you're not the fighter pilot, even if you may well be the fighter pilot, because you just don't know. And all of this, what I'm what I'm kind of getting at and talking around is this well-known experiment that I can't reference the name, but they take a room of, I don't know, 50, 100 people and if you and they have them all flip coins. So, you know. You, they're unbiased coins and say so you have a room of 100 people everybody flips the coin you know comes out heads for half tails for half the people who get tails are out of the game now you have 50 people they all flip a coin you got 25 12 down to one and then they interview that person and they genuinely believe that there was something special about them Jenny, I think this might be in Nassim Taleb's book, Fooled by Randomness. Fooled by Randomness. It's literally being fooled by randomness. Mike Burry, how do you know 
you know that there it's clearly 50 50 chance but the guy who and they do they repeat this experiment multiple times so how do i know all of that is a very long and laborious way of saying assume i'm a drunk in a bar that's not saying i am a drunk in a bar but um i'll give you another story of um uh oh what is the oh damn it why am i not remembering the name of the fund um this had uh, a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist and uh, they were based in Connecticut. Uh, they had enormous amount of money. Anyway, they were convinced they were geniuses. And in 999 times out of a thousand, um, they would have been proven right. There was a one of a thousand chance if the markets went the wrong way and spreads diverged in a certain way rather than converged, that uh, they'd be proven wrong. And guess what? So here's a, something else. There's a very powerful. This may be the best lesson, the best thing that I can share with you. And it, it's kind of like it's almost spiritual. Life will seek out your weaknesses the world will find and it, the more successful you are the more likely it is to happen expect your weaknesses to be uncovered by life um you know if you have an aversion to a certain kind of risk that risk will find you if you have a predilection for narcissism or a predilection for a certain kind of uh, ceo of a company or that risk that weakness will find you so sooner or later you're gonna we're all if we plan on being successful we're gonna have to confront and conquer our worst weaknesses because our strengths will our strengths will help us to be successful so those strengths will continue to work for us but sooner or later as our strengths allow us to be successful the weakness will become more and more prominent until eventually that's the thing that's going to take you out <laughs> if you like and that's what happened. That's what, in a certain way, happened with this MCF guy. That's what happened with the fund that I wish I remember the name of. And um, so, why not start with that up front and say, "I'm going to focus. I'm going to become super aware of my weaknesses today." That's the point of the drunks and bars. And my point there is, we know that the human brain. It turns out that the, one of the best ways of thinking about the brain is that it's like all these different personalities knocking around, you know. So you got the you got the reptilian brain. You know that's easy for me to describe. The reptilian brain is like you know, it's less intelligent than a dog. It just goes, do I fight flight? Do I do I fight this thing? Do I run away from it, or do I just freeze and do nothing? And that that uh, so you know significant others. We've all been in fights with significant others where that reptilian personality takes over. And you either want to slam the door on the person or you want to shout in their face or you're just going to like, I'm going to ignore her. This is flight, fright, freeze. So you've got that personality. You've got various other personalities. You've got the, you've got the hunt personality, you know, that just seeks out. You know, Whitney Tilson says, um, I want to wait until I'm trembling with greed. You know, that's a so so the drunks and bars kind of says I'm actually a collection of these very strange personalities knocking around in my head. And I think that I'm in control, but I'm actually not in control. And we have plenty of evidence that shows that in so many circumstances, we're not in control. The minute you go and say, well, actually, I'm a bit like a drunk in a bar. Uh, now we're going to set up the bar in a way that's going to help me out. So you know, structure your life in such a way that in spite of all of those flaws, all of those different personalities knocking around, we're more or less going to get to the right result. So if I was a drunk in a bar, you know, and obviously we know that getting too drunk is bad. In fact, let's just argue for the purpose of this conversation, being drunk is a terrible outcome. And I'm an alcoholic in a bar I might be, a, you know, so, you know, I'm going to go to my bar designs, I'm going to say, listen, all the alcohol, we're going to have it under lock and key. Yeah, and it's going to be completely out of reach. And by the way, because I'm an alcoholic and I know that it's good to drink water, you're going to put a bunch of uh, vodka bottles, but you're going to just fill them with water. It's going to say vodka on it and I'm going to be drinking water all day long. I'm going to structure my environment in such a way that... So I'll give you an example of that. So I'm 
very lucky to have an amazing relationship with my father. He's a very significant investor of mine. And um, my wife noticed that when I talk to him, when markets are stressed and I talk to him, my, my stress levels go down. That's the equivalent. So it's like, you know, if I'm stressed, call him up and talk to him. He's an amazing companion to have. So, you know, that's kind of like the bottle of looks like vodka, but it isn't. <laughs> and that's good for me. Set yourself up. James Clear, actually fantastic book. Even though I didn't enjoy it as much of a, as I ought to the first time, Atomic Habits, he actually has, you know, all you need to do if you want to eat less hobnobs is just put them slightly out of reach. And and that seconds of, you know, do it so that you just have to climb onto a chair or, you know, lay out your sports clothes. You know, some people, the way they do it is they go to sleep in their sports clothes. So they put on their sports clothes because that extra friction of, so, you know, this is all relevant to investing in a thousand different ways where something is not healthy or unlikely to, or has a higher probability of leading to a bad investment result, just put it a little further out of reach and take the things that are going to give a better investment result and pull them in. That's the point about the drunks and bars. And actually once one wakes up to that, it's like, it's, it's not just for investing, it's for life in a certain way. It's for staying fit, staying healthy, having good relationships. And again, it, it all goes back to Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Was that why you stopped using Bloomberg Terminal? Um, Putting it out of reach. So, so I, you know, I just wrote an essay that I'm, I'm super pleased about. Yes, it was, but you know, and what I wrote this essay about is that, you know, I, we all have, I think, but I'll talk about me, a love-hate relationship with the internet, not just Bloomberg, because how do you deal with this funnel of information and? You can't be effective in investment research without using the internet. I mean, that's where you're going to go. That's your first source of information. So it's at once this amazing uh, knowledge gathering machine and at the same time a source of distraction from the boom, doom, gloom report from a thousand different other things. And my first attempt was actually not the right answer, but it was at least an attempt, which was, uh, switch the Bloomberg monitor off, put the Bloomberg on a standing desk, have a library with no computers in it. My my 2.0 of that now is actually, you can see it laid out here. So uh, what I do in every office that I'm in now, if I possibly can, is I have two desks facing each other. On the one side, there's the computer screen, but I can go to the other side where there's nothing and I can do non-computer related work. And so... I think that it's not about having the Bloomberg monitor or not, or even about having it switched on or not, but having routines that allow me to, so it, it you, you, that was too granular, it was not granular enough, it wasn't down into the micro, it was too macro. It's not yes or no, you can't say no computers in my life because they're too useless, or, or sorry, not too useless, but they, the, the negative outweighs the positive. We have to get into more granular thing, and. I mean, there are all sorts of things. So I would say the um, Evernote actually helps me because I now, rather than tweet something out or rather than read it in the moment, I clip it and read it later and it will take away distracting ads and what have you. I think one of the big benefits actually of a Bloomberg is that it takes away, it's a standardized way of looking at something. So, you know, you get a news report, it's, it's like it's there just the text in a lot of cases and i think that's really really useful but um within the bloomberg monitor i would say that i uh, when they first came out so you could have either the kind of viewer screen or you could have the bloomberg monitor cover the whole thing and I, a launch pad they called it launch pad and first i was like i'm gonna have a launch pad you know i'm gonna have like i used to have four screens i'm gonna have like there's like this whole array you know and then I actually realized, no, no launch pad, get rid of it. Uh, I have the browser and I will go on individual things and look because, because actually bringing all that information up at once is too much and too many opportunities for distraction. So it's not yes or no to the Bloomberg monitor. It's not yes or no to the internet. It's getting diving into the weeds and saying what yes, what no. So in a certain sense, if we go back to the drunks and bars, it's not 
go into the bar or not. You have to be in the bar. But now, where's the vodka bottle? Where's the water bottle? You know, the super, super alcoholic stuff has to be completely behind lock and key. Actually, I, I decided to download TikTok because I wanted to see what my children are watching. And, uh, you know, we have... So I understand how when you got the blue, the, the, the sort of the um, notification thing lights up on Facebook, that's kind of a little hit of dopamine. But something about the way the TikTok platform is set up is like the hits of dopamine are like way, way stronger. So actually what I decided with TikTok is that I don't have it. I, I, if I want to check in on TikTok, I have to download it then I have to connect it, look at it, and then I delete it afterwards. And that's my sense of putting something slightly out of reach. And actually, after watching The Social Dilemma, mm -hmm. Laurie, my wife, deleted Facebook from her phone. So I think that's something that many people are doing. They're saying, okay, I'll check social media, but not on my phone. So social media is only available on, on their computer, which is a completely different experience. So, so I think that we, we live in an age where we have to we're not we're, we're beginners at starting to engage with I mean, I mean a great example is my son my son built a computer i'm very proud i'll look at my son he can build a computer that was great and actually playing games sometimes is great but playing games all day every day maybe not great so so i think that that's a challenge that we all have i'm not telling you not to use a bloomberg monitor i'm saying be intelligent about it yeah I think my idea is to jump into the fire round. Yeah, sure. Okay. This is, I'm extremely excited for this. Yeah. Um, so I've prepared a couple of short-ish questions, which yeah. I want you to expand on, um, but it's going to be in a rapid fire mode. Yeah. So the first question, uh, and you, you talk about plenty of books uh, yeah. in the education of a value investor. What is the book you've gifted most to your friends, family, and anyone you meet? Yeah, so, so I had the benefit of seeing these before. And so uh, what came up for me, I don't have the notes in front of me now, but um, recently I've been gifting Simon Sinek's book, uh, The Infinite Game. And there's another book by somebody else called The Infinite Game. And I think it's a wonderful book with some really great insights. So I've been gifting that. Um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Uh, I'm getting a nod here, so I guess you've seen it. How to Win Friends and Influence People is a spectacular book. So I think that, that those are the three that I've been doing the most of. Then I, I, a fourth one that I've been doing quite a bit recently is by a guy called Sonke Ahrens. He's a German guy. And it's called How to Take Smart Notes. And I've been particularly enamored with a guy called Niklas Luhmann. I don't know if you have followed him, but it's all about how to manage myself in the knowledge acquisition process. And I talk about it a little bit in this essay that I wrote. So uh, that's four. I've actually uh, ordered the note-taking book after finding it on your uh, Twitter. So, oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it helps me out with university. Uh, but It will. It will. And no, no doubt it will help you with life, I believe. Yeah. So uh, another, yeah, it's not a book, but I would just tell you that there's this tool that I've just started using that I think is extraordinarily powerful. It's called Rome Research. And uh, it's kind of a note-taking app, you can argue, but really, really interesting. And it's helping me to, you know, so so this guy, so, so this is all recent finds for me and it's not books, but I feel compelled to share it because I've just written about it. And I think they're amazing guys. So a guy called Tiago Forte, He's just had a baby. I know that because I follow his Twitter feed. He talks about building a second brain. And uh, it goes to Sonke Aaron's book, Taking Smart Notes. And um, so we think using our environment. And so we have limited short-term memory. We have to take the things that we see and we have to write them down or capture them in one way or another. And then we learn and expand our knowledge by interacting with those notes outside of us. Those notes outside of us can be considered to be a second brain, if you like, or they may be part of our brains. Um, I think that's extraordinarily powerful. Sanke Aaron's book gets into it, but 
so does Tiago Forte and um, another woman who's here in London called Anlor. I don't know how to pronounce her name probably Anlor Less Labs, Anlor Le Kampf. She's here. She's originally Moroccan, and you should interview her. But that's a whole other story. And for Tiago Fortes, if anyone wants to check that out, I, I believe that's Forte La uh, Forte Labs. Yes, right? that's right. Um, and and uh, Anne Laura is Nest Labs. Nest Labs. Okay. And they both were called to my attention by a guy called David Perel, who will be extra David underscore Perel, extraordinarily will be extraordinarily successful. So, yeah. And so you mentioned Rome Research. Yeah. Um, I'm very interested in hearing what is one purchase, and hopefully it's not Rome Research, but what is one purchase under $100 that you've made recently that has brought you the most benefit to your life? Oh, so recently can be, we can we can expand that a little bit. The cappuccino I had yesterday, does that yeah. count? <laughs> I, you, you know, you I like saw, your coffee. I saw that question, but but now I'm I'm not, I'm blanking on what it would be. I actually, what, what I want to go with on that is um, uh, the Moleskine notebook actually, because I, I've learned how to use, so I now have a system for using the Moleskine notebook and I, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And I guess because it's helping me a lot. So yeah, I'll just, um, this is actually, well, this is these are these are sort of like initial notes on on George Buckley. I actually I pulled out the photograph, and he's just a guy that I want to follow a little bit more closely. And I'll just I didn't realize I was going to do this, but I'm going to turn back to. Uh, and this is like a, this is um, something that if you look on online, it's called a common book. But this is where I capture when I'm not in front of a computer fleeting notes, and. Uh, there's something else that I found from the FT here on um, how people buy cars. So I don't know. Uh, but so the Molsky notebook, the way I, there's a whole process by uh, oh, process. So, uh, you know, on a blank page, I will write on this side and I will leave, leave this side blank so that I can come back later and see something that I wrote. And so here's something where I was taking notes on something on this side. But I have plenty of space to fill out on this side. And then, you know, this is just, I don't know, this is, I don't know exactly where I got it from, but uh, there will be an index. And the funny thing is that the index is never on the first page. So page 22 is the index in this thing. So here I go to page 22. And if I want to find stuff, so here I have page 24 is blank, page 58 has got notes on true panion so that I kind of have an index there and then I'll number the pages so that I can go through to page 58 and I can see the notes that I wrote on true panion now so so look I as a student took notes so I'm used to thinking with a pen and paper in my hand but um, so as somebody who would be familiar to the Brits is Dominic Cummings you heard of Dominic Cummings so if you go to his blog his blog is still up the guy, whatever you think politically, the guy is incredibly smart and ha either has good ideas himself or is connected to good ideas. So uh, he switched me on to this idea of spaced repetition. So I took notes on Trepanion. I didn't put a date on this, but, you know, and they're, they're, it's scroll. It would be hard for me to read. But there were some salient points that I took down on that company. Now I come back to it and I'm actually reviewing so I'm doing spaced repetition. There are salient points which are now be getting committed into memory. So, so actually, a moleskin, when well used, is an extraordinarily powerful thinking tool, and uh, I'm super excited about it because now it's becoming. And I have, since I started doing this, and it started during lockdown. I have about there's about six or seven of them that I'm slowly uh, filling out, and so I feel like my capacity to take in and absorb the right knowledge has gone through the roof and you know the simple and you know i've experimented with different ones so tomoe river is a japanese one but i actually like the moleskins the most so anyway that's my hundred dollar purchase yeah and i don't own shares in moleskin i would tell you that i did look at them up so so the, yeah i was kind of frustrated because this is an italian luxury goods company their sales are about 
I think about 160, 170 million euro right now. And I thought, ha, interesting. I'm going to, you know, that could be something that I might want to buy shares in. And they were acquired by a Belgian automotive distribution company called Ditteran. Now, the, the, and, and this is a minuscule part of their business. So, you know, nothing doing. But anyway, yeah, there we go. Moleskin. <laughs> so in that question, you also answered that uh, you you started doing that quite a bit during quarantine. Yeah. Uh, so we have a tweet from you here that says uh, things <laughs> I can do during quarantine for March 13th. Read yeah. annual reports, take long walks, Skype with family and friends, write thank you notes and do Zoom calls. Yeah. Um, is there anything that surprised you during quarantine and any any new habits that you started? I started the podcast that was that was useful and fun. Uh, and I something I'd wanted to do for a long time and the quarantine gave me the opportunity to do it. So that was great. Um, I think that all of this learning, this approach to learning has been great. But I think that so that that's all been wonderful. I think that so podcast and really on really managing myself far better than I've ever managed myself in the past has been really wonderful. And I've had some really good due diligence conversations with people so that's been great the negative has been to realize and i think that they say that this may be hitting one in five members of the population uh, i thought we we're, we're more than blessed with the extraordinary spacious homes that we could live in and i thought that we'd have no problem as a family in lockdown i didn't realize the degree to which young people including our children need contact with their peers and we went through a six month period where our children did not have contact with their peers and that's created strains in our family and we are amongst the most lucky and so i say if it's created strains in our family what kind of strains has it created in other families i think that the lockdowns are the most vicious and unfair imposition on young people and i don't my best sense is that you guys aren't as hard hit as teenagers but it is extraordinarily and enormously unfair for the people who are vulnerable to make to impose on beha behavior on people who are not vulnerable and i i think that you know i'm not a scientist but i think the political system has gone it wrong and um, do we want to reduce deaths? Absolutely. Do we want to reduce the spread of the virus to the vulnerable? Absolutely. But that should not come at the expense of the lives of young people who've got their whole lives ahead of them. Uh, people who are vulnerable can self-isolate. They can take all kinds of evasive action to make sure that the virus doesn't get to them. Uh, but, and you know, if you're grandparents of young children, it, does that mean that you don't see them well that's possible but that doesn't mean that every young person shouldn't go to school you know so um there have been some positives but believe me i would i would prefer not to see the disruption that is happening in people's lives and uh matt ridley said something which i wish was getting more coverage which is if the medical communi community were to evaluate the lockdowns as if it were medicine it would be dismissed very quickly for the very dangerous and significantly negative side effects if it was held if 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 the lockdowns were held to the same standard that any medication is held to they would be they would be ruled out of hand you know so in any case uh, i i don't know you know if it's got nothing to do with investing may have nothing to do with the interview but i it, it is i believe that we're going through a kind of a madness i think that uh for reasons that I don't fully understand, the governments aren't able to get a grip of what is the most rational thing to do. And I think that the the enormous lack of compliance that we're seeing in populations, populations recognize that. And you know, the, the interesting thing is we were talking about Russia. Uh, and um, I two or three years ago, I made myself read War and Peace, which is just an amazing book. And they talk, uh, Leo Tolstoy talks in War and Peace about, you know, the days when the, the Napoleon had won the Battle of Borodino and is marching on Moscow. And this is like, this is possibly the worst crisis as a country that Russia ever had. I mean, Russia, the state had been formed. 
and now they're being invaded and not just being invaded the, the, the invader is winning and is marching on Moscow and the the end the end message that I took away from that book is that you know generals here and there politicians and the ruling class here and there are saying all sorts of things at the end of the day it was the reaction of the common man in day-to-day -day decisions that won the war for the Russians and against the French and got the French out of Russia I think that that's what's going to happen here in the coronavirus Corona, coronavirus is you got Dr. Fauci in the United States and you got the scientific community community here and you've got you've got the politicians and you've got lockdowns and the end away I don't think that's going to make much difference the population are going to do what they're going to do and that's the most important thing and I'm just really sorry for the impact that it's had on my family and the impact it's having on the on on other young people but um I don't know what to do about it. I mean, I think that part of it is that younger people are less politically plugged in. And in a certain way, maybe something that's, I mean, none of us are UK citizens and we're here in the UK right now. But young people have to say, wow, our interests are not being represented. We better get some, we better get better organized and make sure that they hear our point of view. Nobody's actually hearing young people's point of view on this. And you know, it's in terms of the ethics somebody who's 80 years old you know if you if it's not just it's how many years do you have left to live and the content of those years and it is unfair to impose costs on young people when they have their whole lives ahead of them and this is going to make a huge differences to the outcomes in their lives you actually should weight it in favor of the younger people you know so yeah <laughs> Guy, moving uh -huh. on from quarantine, I have a photo of <laughs> wow. you here in Monish. Yeah. Um, this is from 2019. Can you explain about your uh, love for TED and your involvement with the organization? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I think that TED is suffering because, because you can't do online what you do offline. And um, I think that, look, I, I don't think that going to TED has helped my investing at all. But life shouldn't just be about investing. I think it's made me, it's given me a richer life. And, you know, you better damn well enjoy, enjoy the journey because it's one journey. So to end up, you know, um, there, there's a, the joke, some rich guy died. Uh, do you know how much of his fortune he left behind? And the guy says, I don't know how much. And the answer is all of it. <laughs> So I don't think that it's helped. I don't think it's hindered. And who knows, it might have helped. But I've uh, had the opportunity to um, walk across the street with Bill Gates. <laughs> it was right next to me. It was kind of cool. I've had the opportunity to have many interactions with Lee Lu at the TED conference. That's been extraordinary. I was titillated by the opportunity to stand in the same room as um, uh, Sergey Brin uh, one year and so that's all kind of Reed Hoffman was there one year so that's all pretty freaking cool At the same time did that bring me I think and the talks are there is something really special about being in the room with those talks and I, I I was before we went I don't know what my life would have been like and who I would have been had I not been attending the TED conference so I think that I've become a more interesting person. My family's become a more interesting place. I think it's, I think that, but here's the takeaway for, for you guys and anyone who wants to listen in is it was an investment and maybe you're getting to that in social capital. So I had this conversation with a member of my family yesterday. Have you, have you listened? I'm sort of pausing because this could be a whole 20 minutes and I don't know how much the reader is the listener is interested in this but uh, this how lucky I am that I heard this talk by I don't remember his first name Collier is his last name first reunion at business school he says you guys are all going to do fine financially but as the reunions go on more and more of you are not going to show up to reunions and by and large when you don't show up to reunions the reason why you're not going to show up yeah, there'll be some who just live the other side of the world who didn't have time. But one of the most significant reasons is that you'll be going through issues in your family. You'll have a divorce, probably. 
and um, many of you will be getting divorced in situations where you didn't have to get divorced it's because you just didn't invest the time and the energy to have the best possible marriage and the best possible family that you have he said you guys have all been trained over the last two years at business school and probably before to know a lot about your financial balance sheet but trust me it's going to be fine but you're going to completely ignore all these other things and i have one message to give you which is take care of that side of your balance sheet and so you know what is that social psychological health whatever it is that we can treat we can kind of consider that you know look at the balance sheet of a company and you know the accounting looks at accounts receivable and inventory and um cash and long-term investments and add it you know in a personal accounting add it into your kind of personal balance sheet what what is my psychological capital what does that look like and what does that mean you know what what have i done with myself that makes my life worthwhile and so if if i go and visit the antarctic it's an expensive trip but nobody can take that memory away from me it's there or that's the, with my family for the rest of our lives that's an investment in the social or psychological capital some kind of capital of our family or and if i go and run a marathon if i do a triathlon that's uh, adds to me and so i think that where ted fits in is in that framework and um so it was an investment in my future self or uh, a better life better life not in terms of having a ferrari parked outside but better memories and the people who seem to live the most successful lives there's this i think it's bernie siegel who's an oncologist and you know how do you deal with people who have terminal cancer who can't necessarily get rid of it and then there are these amazing stories where somebody's diagnosed with terminal cancer and is cured from it or they they and and bernie siegel's belief is that either way who knows whether it helps but use the diagnosis to give yourself permission to do whatever you want to do and you know in a certain sense what we all want to do is make the world more beautiful that's the most meaningful life and so whatever way you can find find ways to make the world more beautiful today because then you'll be on a great journey and you'll be investing in your sort of social and psychological capital if you like uh i'm diving into something and i'm getting nods so i'm going to keep going with it but the question that i ask which is i just just think is a fun question imagine for a second i have imagine for a second that my net worth is 100 times chelsea clinton's net worth let's imagine for a second that she and i are the same age and let's imagine for a second that she and i were uh are both american citizens all of which is not true but let's just imagine for this it is but more or less it's mr guy spear and chelsea clinton and the question is who's more likely to become president of the united states or hold high political office of any kind and even given that the political capital of the clinton family is not what it was i don't think we'd be have a hard time saying that it was chelsea why it's really interesting i you know assume for a second that we have the same intelligence and the same social skills her in that in that, in our case you could call it political capital is way higher she's met more heads of state she's met more people who can help her leaders of the democratic party you name it and what is really important about that is that that capital is not taxable so you don't get taxed for that and we could run the same we could run the same thought experiment so i think that to invest in yourself in that way that you have relate first of all psychologically you have memories when you go through a difficult patch you can say well i've been living a good life but then to invest you in yourself in terms of who knows who in the society you live in knows who you are and appreciates that you exist and and would want to help you or would want to do business with you and you know why would you in a soccer game for example play by the rules and allow yourself to lose when if you kind of break the rules a little bit you could win and again forgive me for saying it, jordan peterson has the answer 
because you're not just playing that one soccer game, you're playing a series of games and you want to be invited to the next game. And the person who cheats in the soccer game might not be invited to the next game. So you're engaging in a bidding contest for some company that's being auctioned off and you could break the rules and win the contest or you could keep by the rules and possibly lose the opportunity. You play by the rules because you want to get invited to the next auction. And so um, TED is a way of investing in that social capital. And I can tell you that I came at it like with the thank you notes with a kind of a selfish, I'm gonna you know, go meet Sergey Brin and I'm gonna convince him to invest a bit or whatever it is. And I think what, what's really important to recognize is we talked earlier on about, um, you know, greed. Engage with that greed. Don't don't pretend it doesn't exist, and then use that greed in a positive way. So it's okay to go to the TED conference, and with that sort of kind of acquisitive, uh, uh, sort of the desire to win. It's okay. Engage with that because a lot, you know, you, you'll find a way to use it in a more in a, in a more wholesome sense, and so. It's okay to do it. And that's how I went to TED. And, and yeah, it did change my view of the world a lot. I think that I can count Bruno Giussani who's the European director as a friend and he's introduced me to some people and he, it, it's been great to have him in my life. Really great. So um, there's TED, yeah. <laughs> Guy, moving on to uh, the last photo and a more cheeky photo <laughs> is of your time at uh, your alma mater, Oxford yeah. University. That's Could amazing. you expand on this photo and also tell us what would you what you would have done more of in university? <laughs> that's so interesting. Um, so that is here. Let me take a look. It's it's so that's up on the internet. I didn't even realize it's up on the internet. But um, so that's me. I didn't realize there's a gap between my teeth there. And um, uh, the guy in the middle, his name is Kevin Town. I don't know where he is right now. But uh, and the guy on the right is called Nikolai Ahrens. Actually, um, Nikolai is on Twitter now, so you can tweet him and say hi to him. Uh, he actually, like me now, has, moves between London and Zurich, so he's back and forth between London and Zurich. And I think that in this case, one of us had just done our final exams and we were celebrating, you know, you get these photographs where somebody's dressed in the exam, taking clothes and they get covered with uh, sort of like cream and stuff. And so I think that that's what was taking place. But I'll tell you something that's interesting. And I, I, given my enormous misjudgments, for example, with D.H. Blair and other things, but there was one thing that I'd figured out, which is an interesting thing. I'd figured out, not then, I was too young then, but, but before I went to business school, I remember telling a friend, somebody who was probably part of this group of friends, and, he, and I said, if I can just get $100 million to trust me, then life will be okay. I said, if I can get $100 million to trust me, they're not gonna, when somebody trusts you with that much money, they're not gonna stop you from sending your children to the schools they wanna attend. They're not gonna stop you from taking a vacation from time to time. They're not gonna stop you from flying business class so that's that's kind of the goal and I actually you know that was that was a smart goal that was a good goal to have actually so that's what's going on there it's amazing you have a cycling photograph there you don't want to take the cycling. I do <laughs> now I mean referring to quarantine how much cycling did you do during quarantine and what is when do you do cycling and how how much do you enjoy it because I find <laughs> it awfully painful to be honest so uh do you like eating hot food? Not, f not, not for me. Is so, that you? Yeah, I do. It's, yeah, right. it's part of the okay. Nigerian culture. So, so, right. yeah. <laughs> you will understand the phenomenon. I have it from my Mexican wife. So it, this doesn't work for me, but it does work for her. So I see her eating and there's a super hot sauce and you can measure the hotness of sauce. So it's super hot. And this is causing her pain. Yeah. But then she finishes the mouthful and and she she does more hot sauce <laughs> and then it causes her more pain and is like do you understand yeah, that I do. so yeah it's anathema to me too and i can do mild sauce i'm a kind of a beginner i can do mild sauce mild hot sauce uh, like what is mild for you is that sriracha or 
Uh, I don't know that I can tell you that anything that is in a restaurant is mild okay. in a in a in a Western country or a Northern European country for sure is mild. So why am I telling you this? Because she has the pain, but then she wants another one. And so I went on one of my first um, calls with somebody and, and he explained to me that he said, look, cycling up hills is a bit like eating a chili pepper. You eat it and you go, oh, that was, you know, wow, this is so painful when you're eating it. But once you're done, you say, hmm, that was rather good. I think I'll have another one. And then you understand that, don't you? <laughs> yeah. And my wife, and I watching my wife, I and, um, can't do anything else on a bicycle. Can't read, can't look at your phone, can't even talk to somebody. So, uh, so that that is, it may be that right there I am forced into a zone where I'm just cycling, and so I find that psychologically very very rewarding. Not to mention that I enjoy eating, and if I go cycling, I can eat a lot afterwards, and so that feels good as well. Um, it's funny because you know. I would have liked to have thought that I would be a more avid tennis player, for example, and that I'd be, you know, like this guy, Jorge Paulo Leman is big into tennis. You know, he doesn't go cycling. He's the, he's the guy who's behind the InBev, um, the huge beer company. It's a Brazilian family. Also, this children, by the way, oh Brazilian Swiss. Uh, one of the richest men in Switzerland when he's in Switzerland came to live in Switzerland because there was a kidnapping attempt on his life in uh, in Brazil uh, they are going to they're behind on shoes and they're going to take on shoes this is a kind of a Swiss uh, trainer brand that Roger Federer is invested in but anyway so he's well known to be into tennis and it's a more social sport but there's something about the solitariness of cycling that really appeals to me I think that what's hard for me when I look at that, the photograph that you have there or the excerpt image that you have is that I've done so much, so far less cycling that I really would have liked to have done, you know. Uh, there are, I don't know how many coals or mountain passes in Switzerland and I've done like two, you know. So one of which is Albius, but cycling's a great sport. I should give it a shot. Um, and to, to wrap up, um, I have one final question, and that is, if you could put, if you had a giant billboard in the center of every university in the UK, yeah, what would you write or put on it? Yeah, lockdown suck. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, Brexit was a mistake. Uh, uh, no, actually, I, so so I had the opportunity to think about this, and I had one, I had a couple of other um, snarky ones. Actually, this one's snarky as well, but it's the one that I'd put up there. <laughs> You're not as great as you think. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that that comes from a famous line that Golda Meir gave to her minister. So she was one of these. <laughs> uh, so there's, before I go there, you know, Margaret Thatcher was the only female in her cabinet. There's a spitting image where the waiter's coming to serve her and her cabinet, she says, uh, what would you like? And she says, uh, oh, I'll, I'll have the, you know, would you like fish or meat? And she says, oh, I'll have the meat. And then the waiter says, oh, and, and the vegetables? And she says, and she, she turns to a cabinet, she says, yeah, the vegetables will have meat as well. <laughs> Which, but anyway, so this is Golda Meir, Prime Minister of Israel, single woman, all male cabinet. And she apparently says to the cabinet meeting, don't be so humble you're not that great <laughs> so so yeah you're not that great i think and that why first of all it's of course it's so wonderful to have an elite education but you do much better by focusing on what the elite education didn't give you and the biases that uh, you have as a result of it i also think that it's a you know say that to england or great britain you're not that great i mean i, I just think that there's a transition that the UK, I thought it had been through it, but the UK's got to go through a transition that other European countries, I think the Netherlands is through it. So the Netherlands was a great power, had an empire, a small empire, had properties around the world. They've accepted who they are. I think that Germany has done a fantastic job of accepting, Germany's just an amazing place. I mean, there's a book that just came out in the UK called Why the Germans Do It Better. Uh, which 
um, I was going to say something negative about it, but I, I was slightly disappointed, but maybe because I know Germany quite well. Uh, but I, th I think that, you know, I mean, I don't know if you guys visited Berlin. I um, worked there. So, so modern Berlin is, is a very, very special place. It's a, it's a special place because of the people who made it special. If you think of the Bundestag and the way they recreated that dome in glass, you guys are really intelligent saying, hey, we're about our history. We're also about an openness and we want to have, you know, you think of that and then you compare that to the House of Parliament, you know, which is so untransparent in so many ways. And they wanted to say, we want to create a transparent democracy. And, and then you have the um, memorial to the murdered Jews of, of Europe. And I think that it's right next to the Brandenburg Gate. They took prime real estate, vast tracts of prime real estate, they could have made it into a park. They didn't even make it into a park. So, so Germany is a country that is engaged with its past and it's a very honest way. And, and is, you know, and it's a bit like if I engage with my demons, greed, for example, uh, ambition, then I'll be a better person on the other side. So Germany's engaged with demons very, very well. I think that actually, well, France is still engaging with its demons in a, in a it's currently engaging. Britain hasn't even started, unfortunately. And, and the debate is, you know, when, you, when I look at the debate over colonialism, it is, it is such a, it's not a rich debate. It's a very, it's, you've, got, you've got two sides. You've got one side that wants to, wants to um, sing Rule Britannia and uh, the other side that wants to tear down statues. You know, and it's like, can we get somewhere between insisting on singing Rule Britannia and tearing down statues? Like, let's find that middle ground. And what does it say about a place that that middle ground is not being talked about in the newspapers that I read? And and it starts off, you know, drunks and bars. You're not a fighter pilot. You're drunk in a bar. It starts off, you know, Germany post World War Two. We're not that great. We just lost the war. We just signed a, you know, Berlin is in ruins and. Uh, what does it take for the United Kingdom to say we're not that great? Because once you say, once you actually honestly say we're not that great, now you can begin the task of developing a persona and a culture and a sense of self that fits with what you actually are, which is pretty great, <laughs> actually. But you've got to start with that. So I think that that's what I, I'd want to put up. I mean, for me, if I just go out of the universities, so where we are right, right now is not that far from a, uh, a roundabout called the Hogarth roundabout. And um, the Hogarth roundabout, people who drive into London will know it because if you come into London in a taxi from the M4, uh, you'll hit the first set of lights is next to a Porsche dealership. And then the next set of lights is the Hogarth roundabout. And over the Hogarth roundabout, there is a flyover flyover that I happen to know because I grew up in the area, that flyover was built as a temporary measure post-World War II. And that flyover is still there more than 60 years later. And if this was Switzerland or if this was Germany or if this was even France, it's like they're, they're just, you're not that great. If that's what you have as, as your infrastructure, you're not that great. And, and if, if if you're about transparency and democracy, but you have a building that does not represent transparency at all, and there are many other ways in which you're not transparent, what are you actually doing? Sorry, this has got nothing to do with investing, but what does it take to get the broad masses of the middle of Britain to find themselves comfortable with their past, colonial past, feudalism, kings, but also to be resolute in walking into a better future with the values that you have. That seems to be something that is missing in British culture right now. It's missing in the, in the way people talk about the country. It's not missing in Germany, in my opinion. Um, I don't think it's missing in the United States. And I think France is trying to do it, but they're not even trying. <laughs> so the so you're not that great is a way of saying 
start trying. So that's a long way of making that point, but you know. Uh, Guy. Yeah. Thank you so much for the interview today. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, upon trying to check out your book in the library at LSC, yeah. I actually found that the copy is missing. So clearly somebody liked it so much that they just took it. <laughs> Might have been me. <laughs> it's still, it's exact, it still says that it's in place, but it's really not. So for all those that are watching, um, we'll see if Guy can sign this copy of the book. <laughs> and then we're going to give uh, this book to the library. So oh, it's actually going to be in place. And please don't steal this copy. <laughs> Guy, thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and, it was uh, really fun. It was great interviewing with you. Yeah, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Earlier in the topic of, of cloning, and yeah. uh, you mentioned uh, Warren Buffett, and um, obviously you're uh, famous for forbidding six hundred fifty thousand yeah. and one hundred dollars uh, for a lunch with Warren Buffett. So I'd just be interested to hear um, about that experience yeah. and how that experience sort of impacted you as an individual. I mean, you know, it really was life changing, and and it, it was life changing in in so many ways. I mean. I didn't, that was not all my money. So I was a third of that, thankfully. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was still an enormous amount of money. I could have bought a Ferrari for that. <laughs> as, as an investor in the company, I think about that from time to time. Um, so I, look, Charlie Munger talks about hanging out with the eminent dead. So we don't have to be in the same room as our mentors as long as there's enough material written about them uh, we can read their books and watch their videos online now and all of those things but boy is there a benefit to being in the room with them and so I got to do that and there's a difference between being at the Berkshire meeting with 50,000 other adulating fans and being in the room with uh, five or six of us or seven or eight of us and so there were because you this is why Zoom at least in its current form is not going to is, is never going to replace, at least not in its current form, um, meeting in person because there are all these micro things that take place that just don't. And so, I mean, it's really horrible to realize that you are not as smart as Warren Buffett. And there mm -hmm. was still a part of me that thought that I might be. <laughs> I definitely didn't feel that way when I came out of the room uh, after, after having had the lunch. And uh, it was painful, but valuable. You know, just uh, I can tell you that, I mean, I think that I've quoted from that lunch two or three times just in this talk. But the small things like he's he's considered to be a miser, you know, but he tipped the waiter. I don't know. He gave him a solid wad, and I'm sure the wads were not one dollar notes. So two, three, four hundred dollars, maybe more. Uh, so where's the miserliness there? But that was also an example of him him saying to himself. I'm in this restaurant every year. I want to have a reputation of being a solid tipper. But why? It's just a smart thing. You're a guy who's worth billions. You don't want a waiter who hates your guts. So make, you know, they could do all sorts of things. They could spit in your soup. They could, so, so give a solid tip so that, that was, you get these kind of, the personal interaction. I also got the sense of the sort of, I haven't seen this in any of the biographies, but it, it kind of a smart aleckness there. So. Um, I made a joke about my investment mistakes and he looks across the table to me and he says, I don't make any mistakes. That's not true. I mean, he, he, airlines, he's insurance company in Australia, there are all sorts of mistakes that he's made, but, but there's an element to his personality that wants to be right. You know, so right. you start, so I think that the launch was perhaps the beginning of seeing him as a human, not as a God, if you like. But I think that then there's the kind of the meta knowledge. And I think that we've discussed how in many cases, it's not the actual thing that you want to know about. It's the actual thing in the context of what it's coming as. Uh, we talked about, you know, how newsletters need to be seen in the context of who's producing it and what motive they have. The, the launch was the realization, part of the learning for me from the launch was the realization that and you guys have done it. So, so when you find the right person, it's okay to invest serious amounts of yourself into being around them because you'll benefit. 
Um, you guys did it by coming all the way out to Richmond to talk to me. You have invested basically a day of your life to expose yourself to me. It's kind of, um, uh, it's, uh, it's extraordinary. I feel extraordinary that you would do that. I feel imposter syndrome, but you do it by doing that. You're actually doing the same thing. You're saying not everybody was created equal in the world. Not everybody is worth equal amounts of time. And when I find somebody that I can learn from, it's worth investing in the day, the train ride, the camera equipment, the preparation work, and to really expose myself. And so as a result of that launch, there's been more than once when I specifically rooted myself through Irvine just to spend time with Monish Pabrai because I knew that that was a positive thing. Get the right people in your life. Or a great podcast, John Lee Dumas. Have you listened to him? I haven't, no. Oh, my God. John Lee Dumas, entrepreneur on fire. Mm -hmm. And what he says is you are the average of the five people you spend most time with. So get around the right people. And that may mean investing time. So Lilu invites me to his 50th birthday party. And I flew out to Los Angeles from Zurich in order to spend time at that birthday party because I knew there would be some extraordinary people there. So I was there just to be at that. And that was kind of the insight that I got in a certain way, the TED conference is like that. And so that meta knowledge of invest in yourself and in extraordinary experiences around extraordinary people will make an enormous difference. Yeah. And you, you mentioned earlier uh, the idea of social capital and how important that is. And I think that's just another really great example of how, in your case with Warren Buffett, how you can directly invest into an experience that will aid your own social capital. So Yeah, and I, I was reading an interview with Lionel Barber, who's the former uh, editor of the Financial Times, and he was talking about some of the more interesting conversations that he'd had. And one was with Prince Andrew. Mm -hmm. That was interesting not because the subject was interesting, but because it's in the FT, you can read it, but it talks about Putin and meeting with Putin and the conversation, and he talks about meeting with Merkel. So think about this. If, if I had the opportunity to go and hang out in any way, shape or form with Lionel Barber, I'm hanging out with a guy whose life and thoughts are informed by meetings with Vladimir Putin and with Angela Merkel, those are, he's an extraordinary guy. So we can do the same thing. I lucky enough, you guys come and talk to me. Part of perhaps the attraction is that I had lunch with Warren Buffett. So my social capital went up sure. and there are all sorts of ways that we can do that. So here's what, here's what I'd be willing. I, well, from time to time, I'm willing to do it. So, uh, okay. So you have, which of these people so i i spent effectively for a three-hour lunch i spent a third of the sum that you mentioned how about how about spending the same amount or an hour at lunch with henry kissinger would you do that or how about david cameron would you do that you know i'm not saying mm -hmm. but but actually i it's not clear to me that investing the money to do it is a dumb move because you because you now have that experience it never goes away from you it never ever goes away from you so don't always focus on keeping the money in the bank sometimes spending the money and sorry i, I there's another so this might be one of the best takeaways of this whole thing so um so you'll get somebody who says all right that's ridiculous i wouldn't spend money on that so somebody would say, somebody would laugh at me and say, oh, you spend money on lunch with Warren Buffett. I got to see him for free for X, Y, Z reason. And they'll, and they'll kind of imply, well, you didn't, you spent money where you didn't have to spend money. Um, I've done this in due diligence. So I will pay, a, pay an expert to have a conversation with me and tell me about an industry. And I think in the past, I would say, well, why the hell should I pay the expert? They're just going to sit and talk to me. And I'd get frustrated because I know that if Warren Buffett was to call them up to have the same conversation, they're going to talk to Warren Buffett for free. And so here's a model that I think is, I think it's probably an accurate description of how life and the world works is that early on, you have to pay a high price for those things. Mm -hmm. 
And then if you're half successful later on, you will not have to pay at all, perhaps. So somebody early in their career spending real money or making a huge investment is not a dumb move. And the guy who sort of says, oh, well, I, you know, I'm not going to go and do that. And when I'm successful enough, those people are going to flock to me. No, you will, you will get successful through doing those things. It was okay to spend the money on the lunch with Buffett at the time. Uh, and that may make it more likely that sometime in the future, I won't have to spend any money to spend time around equally extraordinary people. And so that's in itself a big lesson, actually. And I think that there, the, you know, another way to look at that is there are investments in social capital that one can make that are, that are likely to appreciate and investments in social capital that are likely to depreciate and I, I or, or that look like investments that aren't. So, um, you know, everybody talks about if, if you decide that you're ever interested in wine, <coughs> excuse me, oh dear, I cough. Does that mean I have COVID? Oh, it was just one cough. Um, but so you're looking at a beautiful car or a beautiful rug or a beautiful, and the, and the, and the person, the salesman say, oh, it's a fantastic investment. You know, they're trying to convince you that an, an asset that is without doubt a depreciating asset, a bottle of wine is an appreciating asset. Bad idea, very, very bad idea. Don't think of it as an investment. Um, so think of social capital. I think the launch of Buffett is a big gift that keeps giving in all sorts of ways. I get invited to the Buffett brunch at the Berkshire meeting. There's some extraordinary people there. I've, I can tell stories. Um, give one example. The controller of US currency was there one year and Laurie sat next to her and then she invited us. We managed to visit the treasury, the original treasury building in Washington, which is right next to the White House. And we got a tour of the note printing facility. It was one of two US dollar note printing facilities. And it's pretty amazing to see where they print money. And mm -hmm. we were right there and the printing right next to the printing presses. Um, pretty freaking awesome but so that is a gift that is appreciating it continues to give today it's an increase in social capital blowing a bunch of money on a birthday party with your friends and there are some pretty rich and wise people who do that where you just have a dissolute time that does not appear to me to be much maybe there is but so so even within the world of uh, in you know, spending money or resources to be around somebody, there's things that have the likelihood of appreciating, things that don't have the likelihood of appreciating. Investing in a college education, hanging around the people that you're hanging around with is most certainly an appreciating, an appreciating social asset. Um, wasting your life going after a British honor, commander of the British Empire, OBECB, probably not a good investment of your time and energy, but it's great to even just make the distinction. So, yeah.